On behalf of PCDPM and CGD, welcome to the EFFET Talks, our conversation series on how Europe, the European financial architecture for development could become more strategic, more effective, more collaborative, and lead to more impactful, sustainable uh, outcomes. I'm San Bilal, the head of the uh, Trade Investment and Finance Program at the European Center for Development Policy Management, and I'm joined by my co-host, Michaela Gavas. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michaela Gavas. I'm the co-director of uh, the Europe Program at the Center for Global Development uh, and also a senior policy fellow. Hello, Michaela. It is our pleasure to welcome our guest today. Mr. Thomas Ostros, who is the Vice President and Member of the Management Committee of the European Investment Bank. His portfolio covers a wide range of areas, including development issues and relations with a large number of development countries. Prior to joining the EIB, Mr. Ostros, a Swedish national, has been an Executive Director at the IMF, the Managing Director of the Swedish Bankers Associations, and has been for several years a member of the Swedish government, serving as a minister for industry and trade, as a minister for education and science, a minister for fiscal affairs, and as a deputy minister of finance. What a prestigious career. Mr. Ostros, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. The EIB has been at the heart of the financial architecture uh, of Europe for over 60 years. And naturally it has been one of the focuses of the discussion of the future of the European financial architecture for development. What's your take on these discussions? Uh, how useful has the process been of reflection of the European financial architecture so far? And what are the positive elements that you can take out of it, in particular from the Wise Person Group reports uh, in 2019 and earlier this year on the feasibility study on how to strengthen the effort? I think it has been a very valuable period in many aspects. So because uh, for we have had the limelight on development financing issues uh, also from the finance ministry. And I think that is very valuable. It is not always on top of their agenda, uh, but I, it has been now in their focus. And I think that is very good for all institutions that are involved. So I think that is one strong benefit. And it has also, I think, uh, uh, set in motion uh, a lot of debate within organizations and between organizations on how to improve. And I think that is really healthy. So I think it has been a, a healthy period for, for, for Europe in that respect. Uh, and now I think it's time to go to action. I think now we have had this period, these analysis and these studies, this gives us a splendid basis, but now it's time for, for, for delivering. And I think uh, we are as an institution, the EIB, very well set to uh, improve and to become an even better service provider for the European Union members. Uh, were there from the reports that have been put forward, were there some ideas that you find more inspiring than others? I think we should see this in, in, in the context of, yes, we have very strong strengths uh, within the European Investment Bank in our development activities. And that is highlighted also during this process in, in the reports. First of all, of course, we are the bank of the European Union. We don't try to be aligned with European policies or have the ambition to be aligned. We are part of the European architecture and we are aligned always with European policy. And that is very valuable. I have myself a background, as you mentioned, as minister. I've been in many European councils, uh, innovation and research, uh, trade issues, uh, education issues, competitiveness issues during more than a decade. And I think it is very valuable for EU to have strong institutions. I'm a keen multilateralist. Uh, so we should be always be a very strong part of the multilateral uh, uh, architecture. Uh, and Europe, Europe has a very key role to play, but to be able to be strong, we also need our own strong institutions. So that is, I think, the first strength that we have. Another strength that we have is that we have so much expertise by being the EU bank in tight partnership 
with member states. We are involved in uh, climate issues. We are the EU's climate bank, uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, but also have very strong expertise in life science and health issues. And these are issues that, is, that they are so important in development dialogue today. So we can use that expertise. And uh, a third issue is that because that we are uh, the, the EU bank, we can be a front runner. We could, for instance, take the decision to stop financing uh, non-abated fossil fuel projects. That is only possible in an EU bank. And we are the only multilateral bank that has taken that decision. So that means uh, we have the strength to be bold and to be uh, sort of at the forefront just because that we are the EU bank. But I think also this process shows to areas where we must improve. And uh, one thing I think is very clear that we should increase our presence on the ground. We have now a presence in about 30 countries. Uh, I think we need more of uh, bankers and engineers from the EIB that are actually working on the ground. And we are looking into that strongly now because that thereby we could be more upstream, uh, sort of help partner countries to come up with very good projects that we later can be also financing. So I think that is important, but we should also develop our product offering. And I think that we, we can do a lot there also uh, to strive for not only volumes, but for impact. And I think together with the commission, I think we can in the period ahead, do more in that respect and many other areas, of course. So Thomas, let me just pick, pick up <laughs> one or two of your points. Um, so the, um, the, the Wise Persons Group report and the feasibility study, they both highlighted some of the weaknesses uh, of the EIB. And you mentioned uh, the EIB's uh, limited presence on the ground, but there are some other aspects as well. Um, it's limited experience in least developed countries and fragile states, uh, it's insufficient development impact, uh, the fact that it is particularly risk averse uh, in its lending. And in fact, if I can quote the, the Wise Persons Group report, they, they said uh, that it would require considerable rewiring of business and managerial practices uh, uh, and a different approach to risk taking for the EIB to become uh, the EU's development bank. I mean, what are your views about these criticisms? These are very important points. So let us look at uh, the year 2020. Uh, we had uh, an Africa, we had, uh, we invested 5 billion, we landed 5 billion euros in Africa, responded very quickly to the COVID-19 crisis uh, and uh, went into new partnerships, uh, uh, both on the private and the public sector. Half of that was in the private sector. So many believe that the EIB only do public sector infrastructure engagement, but in fact, when you look at it, half of our engagement is in the private sector. And 70% of our lending in Sub-Saharan Africa was in fragile states and the least developed countries. And how come we can do that? It's because of our very strong partnership with the commission. Uh, most of our activities are in partnership with the commission because we rely on their mandates. Uh, uh, external lending mandate uh, earlier, now we go into the NDG, uh, uh, environment with the new MFF. So we are, of course, very adaptable when it comes to, uh, in relation with the Commission, go into more high impact, higher risk areas, as long as we have this agreement with the Commission. So this, uh, this, uh, this is a field where we are really eager to continue to our dialogue with the Commission. So sometimes we are a bit of a hidden jewel uh, when it comes to development activities. But if you look closer, you see that uh, we have a quite a strong starting point, but areas to improve. Presence on the ground, improve our product offering to see if we can take uh, uh, on projects that have even higher impact and thereby also higher risk. And all of that we need to do together with our strong partners, uh, the commission being the main one. Another field that is important for us is to... Sorry, I just wanted to, you were saying you are a hidden jewel, but I, I was just wondering, why do you think you are still a hidden jewel after so much scrutiny by the member states and, and the commission and independent experts? I mean, from the wise person group and uh, also the independent consultants for the feasibility study who 
who seem to clearly say that the EIB doesn't have sufficient development impact. So why do you think there's this recurrent criticism uh, in spite of the achievements that you have? I think it's totally natural. If I were uh, doing an assessment of any institution, be it EIB or EBRD or African Development Bank, uh, I would look for weaknesses, uh, areas where we can improve. Uh, and uh, uh, what I have seen, I've been now for a year and a half in the EIB, coming from a multilateral institution like the IMF, there is a very impressive activity when it comes to development financing, but there is scope for improvements. Uh, most often, our, the attention directed to us is because of our strong partnership within the European Union. Uh, and I think we can also, by creating a sharper profile, uh, also be more visible uh, as an institution going forward in our development activities, because I think that is also a very important part of being successful. So presence on the ground, improve the way we work, but also have a sharper, clearer profile, uh, and thereby uh, also attracting more partnerships with others. I think these are fields that are definitely areas that where we can improve. What I like with this approach is the Team Europe spirit that the Commission has put, uh, put in place, because this fits us very well. We are one of the main providers of Team Europe action, and we have done that in very close partnership with the Commission. And this is, we feel very comfortable under that umbrella. And when it comes to presence on the ground, we want to also be very closely related to the EU delegations in the partnership countries because that creates this environment where we really can fulfill European ambitions uh, and be in line with European policy and also be of service to, to, the, to the European Union. So uh, this period ahead can be very formative. Uh, and that is why I'm, I'm so positive for the whole vice person uh, process and the feasibility study. So Thomas, just the, one thing I wanted to pick up was really around um, the EIB's risk profile. Um, so again, the EIB has been uh, criticized uh, as an institution uh, having a culture which is prone to risk aversion. Um, now, while, while that can be useful for operations inside the EU, it's not necessarily needed for operations outside of the EU. So uh, how are you going to address this? I think this is so important because this is where our cooperation with the commission, not least, is uh, often very beneficial. Look what we did inside EU with uh, the big Juncker plan, the invest EU that is now the successor. That is why where the commission gives us mandates that makes us now one of the key players, for instance, in the biotech field in Europe, where we are early investors in biotech companies, be it cancer research or COVID-19 vaccine research, where we actually financed BioNTech that created one of the first vaccines in the world against COVID-19. So we are, and that is in the, because we have the commission mandates that creates the maneuver space for us to take very significant risks. This is also what we do when it comes to, to Africa, for instance. So now we are in close dialogue with the commission, how to use the next MFF period with uh, the, the new uh, uh, the budget put in place by the EU to be able to have more impact and do also more riskier investments. We do that already now, but we are definitely ready if the commission is supportive to go further into this investing in equity funds, uh, thereby helping specific areas, but also supporting creation of a, a capital market in, uh, in, in Africa, going into uh, uh, energy projects that sometimes can have high risk profiles, where we, of course, in tight cooperation with the commission can do very strong impact. So even further strengthening gender uh, angle, because we've been very successful in investing with a very strong gender perspective together with the commission. So for us, this is so tightly related to how we cooperate in Europe, uh, not least with the commission. Well, 
one of the discussions in the European financial architecture has been to create a European climate and sustainable development bank. And in fact, uh, Diana Hoye, the, the, the president of the EIB, had himself proposed uh, the creation of a subsidiary uh, for, for the EIB to be perhaps this development entity. Uh, and the wise person group has, has suggested it should be so. Now, the feasibility report is saying basically, well, that's perhaps not the area that we should, uh, we should focus on. And the member state seems to have ditched the, the proposal. Do you think that's a missed opportunity to, you know, to help the EIB improve, not to have a subsidiary to be a development bank? No, I think the discussion uh, focused on something that have never been our ambition, and I don't think any other institution's ambition. So, sort of to create one single entity that would uh, make other entities uh, not relevant anymore. I think that is uh, totally the wrong angle. Uh, and I don't think member states, the EIB, the EBRD, any other institution has been focusing on that. What we want to do is within this system of a, a multi-layered system where we are the EU bank, we want to provide a stronger service to our member states. Uh, also outside EU and be a stronger partner with countries outside EU. So we have never had that ambition. And I think you know, well, we shouldn't prejudge what the finance minister would say in the end. We are very cautious about following their direction, but it seems like that they will end up with, I think the best solution, what is now called the status quo plus solution. So do not close any institutions. There are not too many institutions. We have different uh, uh, roles in this system. The EBRD has the important role of being a bridge to the US with strong US participation. Uh, the, and that is of course a very good strength. Sometimes it can be a bit complicated depending on what the US policy is, but for now it is a very strong positive message from the US on these type of issues. Uh, let EIB develop its development uh, work. And there I see uh, I, I don't see a, a, a subsidiary tomorrow. I see, first of all, steps to, within organization, ring-fence our development activities, raise the profile, uh, improve the offering to partner countries on what we can do, uh, strengthen the cooperation, not only with the Commission, but many other players, EBRD, African Development Bank, World Bank, uh, but also Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and all other actors, WHO, for instance. So in that environment, I think we can do a lot. Then if you look a little bit ahead, my personal view would be that a subsidiary with strong representation from the commission could be attractive for, for Europe going forward. But that uh, is a later discussion to take. Uh, I think we can do a lot just to ring fence and strengthen the profile of what we do. And I think that is what also member states uh, want us to do. What do you mean by ring fencing? Because there was a restructuring a few years ago of the EIB when the uh, external activities of the EIB and the internal activities were, were merged in, in terms of support. And you know, a, a, a common remark is that if you build a bridge in Denmark or, or in Lesotho, you, you have the same standards and the same kind of approach. So are you now talking about a new new restructuring where you would again put the, I mean, where you would go back to the perhaps initial situation where you, you have a clear split between activities within the EU and outside the EU? For me, as a former min For me as a former minister, I am very co conscious about uh, not running ahead of the finance ministers. So we, I, I'm not ready to go into uh, the details yet because we are now in a working mode. And uh, uh, if we get a clear signal from uh, finance ministers to go ahead uh, asking us, how can you contribute with the plus in the status quo? We will surely come back with our contribution after having discussed that with our governing bodies. But uh, I am convinced that there is a reform space here that we can uh, uh, really use and uh, improve in this field. We have a very strong starting point and can be proud of what we do. But uh, as I pointed out, there are areas where we really can uh, uh, deliver even better going forward. And this is a, this is a transformative period. 
uh, for us and for others. And uh, I think we should really show that we can, we can do something here. How realistic is it to embark on this reform process uh, without a capital increase? But we are not talking about, uh, uh, in the first step, increasing volumes. We are talking about uh, using existing capital and existing resources and improve on basis of that. So I think that there's plenty of room to, to, to do things there that I think member states will appreciate. Uh, uh, if member states would like to put more capital into it or the commission, that's another type of question and that is not on the table. So what we are offering now is to come back and show what we can do with existing capital and ex existing resources. And that is, uh, I think, uh, significant. We can do a significant contribution in that. And what could you do more with an increase of capital? I mean, uh, I've been calling for uh, DFIs with other experts and uh, including at CGD for, for uh, uh, DFIs and MDBs to be more counter-cyclical at uh, the time of the, you know, if we try to rebuild back, to build back better uh, as a result of the COVID uh, crisis, we need institutions like the EIB to do much more. And now it's the time to empower them to do more. And the status quo seems to be heading more towards the status quo than the status quo plus, than the plus in the status quo, which seems, by the way, antinomic to talk about a status quo plus. Uh, so perhaps uh, your shareholders will have, and the, the member countries will have to decide if they want a status quo, if they want a plus, but they cannot have both. Well, what, what, what do you stand on these issues? As a person, on personal view, I understand you depend on yeah. your shareholders. Yeah. There's, there's no multilateral development bank that would say no if the shareholders would like to put more capital into it. But we are not there, and that is not the acute discussion. I think that would dilute what is important now, uh, is to, to modernize and to improve uh, what we already do. And I think uh, the commission uh, and the cooperation we had with the commission last year showed uh, with Team Europe that it was possible to give uh, quite a forceful response from Europe uh, in, uh, uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, where we had this record year in Africa, 5 billion euro lending, and we could do it by directly support COVAX very early on. And that benefited the, uh, uh, not only the countries to get vaccine, but also Europe. They were possible for Europe to give a strong immediate response. So, uh, and we've done uh, effort to support small and mids in Africa via local, uh, local banks to be able to support them in liquidity. So all of these things have been possible. Going forward, I think it is not only being counter-cyclical, it is also what, what structurally is needed. And I think health issues after this terrible experience with COVID-19, will come much higher up on the agenda on all multilateral banks. And we, that is the case also for us. So we see now requests and discussions from partner countries on vaccine production, on uh, efforts to improve basic healthcare systems. Uh, uh, all of these issues will be very high up on the agenda. They are not, primarily cyclical, they are structural, and we have seen the weaknesses uh, in the systems, both inside and outside EU, and we must improve that. Um, just, just going back to the status quo plus, um, which seems to have prevailed among the member states. Um, so some people are saying that actually it's likely to fuel further competition between the European development finance institutions instead of creating more cooperation, more synergies between them, and that it is also unappealing for Europe's partner countries and particularly unattractive for European companies, given the different procurement requirements, the different entry points, financing conditions, and the different approaches to risk uh, from the institutions. So this whole issue of status quo plus, is it not true that it is actually the current situation and that uh, you know, the, the fragmentation and the duplication and the competition will just continue to exist? For me, it was the best 
possible solution. And uh, pair that with the Team Europe approach from the Commission. I think you can see the structure work more efficiently together. Then you have uh, EU's own bank, EIB, as a key player, of course. And I think the Commission sees that that is, uh, they cannot be without their own bank in the European context. That's not possible. But we have also very skillful national banks, strongly rooted in their uh, competence, traditions, relations. Uh, that is, they, they are very important. We have the EBRD with the, the specific link, transatlantic link that brings also value added. I think this is not bad uh, to have as a structure. Uh, and it, it will, together with the Commission's ambitions, I think, deliver in a very good way. It would be totally unrealistic, I think, to say that let's dismantle uh, these national banks or dismantle EBRD. And, and, and nobody has wanted to, do, to end up in that type of situation. It would put us in a years and years of structural changes and conflicts. I am actually, together with uh, Vice President in the EBRD, leading a group where we are discussing how can we cooperate more strongly together, because I think uh, there's plenty of room for both of us, uh, and we can do things together that uh, uh, creates higher impact, and we have a tradition of uh, having joint projects, we can do more with that. We are, for instance, looking at how we can strengthen our mutual reliance on uh, uh, each other's assessments of projects. That could be also a very good way of going forward. So I, I think uh, it will be a positive outcome of this process if we cooperate more strongly together. Uh, that would be uh, very welcome and I think really needed uh, in these difficult times. Could you also tell us how you cooperate with the other uh, national uh, financial institutions? Uh, uh, I mean, with the uh, DFIs and national development banks. So what do you see as ways to improve the cooperation, uh, but perhaps based already on, on some of the settings that you already have now? I think there's plenty of opportunity. For instance, uh, when it comes to the health area, which I mentioned, and the vaccine issues, I think there is a growing uh, wish among many European countries to be more active in uh, supporting Africa in health issues in general, but uh, vaccine production, for instance, maybe more specifically. I think here we have a possibility of uh, joining forces, many actors, uh, uh, with the Commission as a, a, a guiding leader here and uh, really to try to, to make an impact. I think these kind of issues, uh, uh, we should be able to do things together that uh, really creates uh, things happening on the ground. Uh, Thomas, we, we heard from some of um, our other speakers uh, about the Commission's role uh, in particular and, uh, and almost a plea for the Commission to take a much stronger, more ambitious, uh, a much stronger role in, um, in steering uh, uh, the policy and in, in steering the discussions. Do you agree? So for us, it is so everyday, much of everyday life to be in strong, in a strong relation with the Commission. And all the requirements from the European Union, we are fulfilling in, in, in every detail, you know, everything from uh, uh, anti-money laundering uh, issues to uh, climate issues to ambitions when it comes to gender equality. We have a very strong reliance with, uh, or strong cooperation with the Commission. So I think we are well placed uh, to do that. Others will have a little bit more of a challenge because the EU requirements are quite high and uh, quite, uh, quite tough sometimes. We have adapted, others might need to adapt uh, going forward. But I think the Commission is a very good leader in that respect that they have also policy dialogue uh, in the partner countries that forms the basis for our activities outside EU. And that is why we want to also cooperate very closely with EU delegations on the ground in partner country so that we are very close to that policy dialogue and can deliver 
on what those humans uh, will uh, end up in. I think this is, is uh, uh, for quite many. Of course, we are bankers. We are not the commission, so we need some way when it comes to what is bankable or not, uh, what the requirements do we have, when it comes to the fundamental direction that the council and the commission is our uh, guidance. This is very valuable also when it comes to specific countries we cooperate with. And it has uh, been obvious uh, in many cases. Uh, I mean, in Belarus, we are now in a, in a very sensitive situation from the European Union with in relation to Belarus. We are a bank that follows uh, European Union's direction in these, kind of, uh, uh, in these kind of affairs and issues. And that, I think, is a comfort for many member states that knows that uh, we are a policy taker, not a policy maker. Uh, Thomas, perhaps could you elaborate a little bit more on, on these kind of issues? I mean, we know that the von der Leyen Commission is, uh, you know, has an ambition to be a more geopolitical uh, commission. Uh, and even one of the issues, uh, you know, talked about is about to foster more economic diplomacy, climate diplomacy, uh, digital di diplomacy. So how do you see the role of the EIB and this interconnection between the Commission and yourself? And, and perhaps related to that, when you were talking about the need to improve from the EIB, should you become a bit, uh, I mean, a bit more than simply bankers, but also be a bit more proactive in supporting some of these uh, commission reflections on how they could uh, uh, be more geopolitical. Yes, I think so. I think uh, I think the commission also sees that opportunity, and I, I think we, I hope that we will have that type of dialogue going forward because not only the commission but also, of course, the council uh, is in need of uh, uh, instruments. And I take the climate issue. Um, Europe uh, has less than ten percent of the. Uh, climate emissions, climate uh, harming emissions. Uh, and if we want to uh, put the globe on a safer path, we must, as Europeans, be active globally. Do, we do not want Africa to develop into a situation where maybe Chinese led investments in coal uh, uh, based energy production uh, uh, increases. We want to use our knowledge and expertise in partner up with African countries to see to that we jointly go in the green direction. EIB is a very good instrument to use for that. And I think that is something that is uh, very much appreciated among many member states and in, in the commission. So I think uh, to be able to be an actor, you must be a true multilateralist, but you must also have your own institutions that can be active in that multilateral uh, environment. And I think we can be very well placed uh, to be that. So Thomas, tell us what would be the recommendations that you would see on, on the way forward for, for the EIB? What kind of uh, um, signal you would like to receive from the member states for the way forward to be able to work better uh, with the other financial institutions? I'm really looking forward to the ECOFIN conclusions uh, that will come uh, probably in a few weeks. And uh, I hope that that will be, uh, that it is a demanding signal on to us to come back with uh, uh, ideas to our governing bodies on how to ev do even better. I think that is, it should be a strong demand from member states uh, that would be highly appreciated to improve in, 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 in fields and to build on our strengths. I, I think that uh, would be very welcome, but let's see what the finance minister finally says. Well, we'll see. We'll hope that indeed there will be demand for, for improvements and that we'll be able to uh, collectively to fulfill these demands. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for uh, joining us today. Yes, thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. It, uh, it, it was a true pleasure and great to meet you and have a nice day.